is starting. Thank you very much. So this is the... Uh, Oh, is the recording starting now, actually? Let me just, <laughs> just double check that. Has it restarted? Yes, okay, good. We've started recording. Excellent. So this is the PowerPoint that you can access on whascience.com, and we're going to go into the radioactivity session. You have to be able to tell me with confidence that protons and neutrons are found inside the nucleus of the atom and that electrons orbit the uh, or over the nucleus in shells. That is a symbol for an electron. It is an E with a minus over it. You have to tell me with confidence that the mass of a proton is one, that the mass of a neutron is one, that the charge of a proton is positive one, that there is no charge in the neutron. You can write down the mass of an electron is zero or one over 1,835 AMU. AMU is an atomic mass unit, and that just means the mass of one proton. The charge of an electron is negative one, and they are found in the shells. You can also use the term orbits. The radius of an atom is one times 10 to the minus 10 meters. That is a number that you must memorize. It is a, um, a required number. No, I'm not going back. It's all, that's why I'm recording the darn thing, so that I don't have to go back. Isotope is the same number of protons the same number of electrons, but with a different number of neutrons. Carbon-612 has got six protons and six neutrons. Carbon-613 has got six protons and seven neutrons. Carbon-614 has got six protons and eight neutrons. How do I know this? This number, the big number, is the mass number. And the mass number, it's always the massive number, it's always the bigger of the two numbers, it contains, it tells you the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if the mass number 12 tells me that there is 12 total mass in that atom, that adding the protons and the neutrons together gives me 12. If I know I have got six protons, then I must have six neutrons to equal 12. This is the atomic number. The atomic number tells you, number one, the amount of protons, and number two, which element it is. If you change the number of protons, you change the element. You can change the neutrons without changing the element, but you cannot change the protons without changing the element. So we have got six protons and a certain number of neutrons. That will make the mass of 13. What number plus six equals 13? Seven. What number plus six gives me 14? Eight. You have to be able to do that for every single atom, but it's the same way of doing it every time. The nucleus is always positive. If I remove these electrons, then my nucleus is positive. Why is that? Because I have got three positive charges in the middle. One, two, three. Three negative charges on the outside. That means plus three minus three equals zero. I will have a neutral atom. If I take away my electrons, my three orbiting electrons, then I am left with a positive ion plus three. There is no charge in neutrons, so we can have as many neutrons as we like without changing the atom. The type of atom depends on the amount of protons. If there are three protons, that means I've got the element lithium. If there are seven protons, that means I've got the element nitrogen. This has got three protons, one, two, three, therefore it is lithium. Electrons are arranged in orbits, energy levels, or shells. <clears throat> these are, <clears throat> excuse me, these are your higher energy levels, meaning that the electrons in these shells have got more energy than the electrons below. Electrons can change orbit. They are not stuck in one particular orbit or space around the nucleus. If they absorb, which means take in, or emit, which means release, EM radiation, my electrons can either jump up or fall down electron levels. So if I, and I'll come on and talk about this in just a second. Absorption, take in, emission, release energy. If EM radiation is absorbed by the nucleus, this is what this little squiggly line is here, then my electron will jump from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. This electron is now in an unstable position. This electron will now want to release energy. The way that atoms can do that is by releasing electromagnetic radiation. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, X-rays, or gamma rays. Yeah, singing in your heads. 
gnarly. As it loses energy, the electron goes back to its original energy level and it releases energy. I'm sorry, I've just had a very shocking thought. Let me just hmm. bet you any money. I'm, I've got no microphone recording me. Oh my bet God. you any money. Oh, maybe just let's have a look. Let's just have a little look here. How do I do this? No, don't tell me. Um, 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 device settings. Speaker, microphone. Okay, now I do have a microphone. Yep. Prop, prop. Okay. Explain how atoms may form positive ions by losing their electrons. Currently, this atom has got four positives, one, two, three, four positives, and four negatives orbiting in the shells. That is a neutral atom. It is neutral because plus four minus four equals zero. The charges cancel each other out. However, if I put enough Electromag if I put enough energy into this atom, my electrons aren't just going to jump to a higher shell. They're going to completely leave the atom. When that happens, I am left with plus four, minus three electrons. Plus four bits of charge in my protons, minus three bits of charge in my electrons, meaning that overall I will have a positive ion. This is the danger. If, if you get hit by radiation and any of your atoms ionize, then they become radicals in your body that can cause damage. Okay, that is not nuclear radiation. What we were just looking at there is electromagnetic radiation. We're now looking at nuclear radiation. Nuclear radiation, funnily enough, comes from the nucleus. The nuclei of some atoms are unstable. To become more stable, the nuclei give out radiation. This is called radioactive decay. When a parent nucleus releases some kind of nuclear radiation, it becomes more stable. We call, an, we call the original atom that before it has become stable, the parent um, nucleus, the resulting, the, 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 the atom that is resulting at the end, so they've released the proton and they've, they've, uh, they've gone down the, the, um, the periodic table, uh, we call that the daughter nucleus. Don't confuse this with the parent, uh, with the daughter cells in mitosis. It's not a daughter cell, it's a daughter nucleus. Different radioactive isotopes decay at different rates and emit different types of radiation. Alpha, beta, and gamma radiation cause nucleons to be ejected from the nucleus, causing an ion to be formed. Background radiation is the constant low-level radiation in the environment. This is a map of the radiation across the Earth, with red being areas where there's high amounts of, of uh, background radiation, and blue being areas where there's low amounts of background radiation. The most common cause of background radiation is radon gas from the ground. Over 50% of the background radiation comes from the ground beneath our feet. Food and drink and cosmic rays then make up a quarter beside each other. Food and drink, uh, not only in the preparation of food and drink, because we sterilize a lot of our equipment using nuclear radiation, but also the fact that bananas and Brazil nuts are themselves radioactive. Cosmic rays is a fancy term for radiation coming from space. Only a tiny proportion of uh, background radiation comes from nuclear power and weapons testing. However, of the artificial sources, medical scans and medical treatments make up the majority of the background radiation. How do we measure and detect radioactivity? On the bottom left there, you can see a photograph being taken of a nuclear explosion. The first, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the first image that you saw was a big blast of radiation going into the atmosphere. And then after that, we saw shockwaves. Oh, hello. Monitor. Monitor's not involved with this. Oh, oh yes, of course. It's absolutely fine. I have got, yeah, we're doing a big revision lecture. And we're going to figure out some video editing. So we are. Thank you very much, Miss. Have a seat, please, Em. And I'll explain why we're not talking in just a minute. You're a star. On the right-hand side, we've got a Geiger-Muller tube. Geiger-Muller tube is really, really easy. Your Geiger counter, yes. Yeah, so a Geiger motor tube is connected to this. So that's your counter. Your Geiger counter works by when it's connected to a Geiger motor tube. Here's how it works. You've got an anode 
uh, which is positively charged, um, and then you have got a cathode, which is negatively charged. There is no uh, circuit between the anode and the cathode. There's a tube here in the middle of my cylinder that you can see on the outside there. If ionizing radiation from a source enters my tube, it will make a gas become charged. It will make the gas that's inside there become positively or negatively charged, depending on what happens. When that happens, there is a closed circuit between the anode and the cathode. When there is a closed circuit, for that brief second, the Geiger counter picks it up and logs it as a count. We can measure the activity of radioactive samples using a Geiger counter. The activity of a source is the rate at which unstable nuclei decay. It's measured in Becquerel's. Please, no, I'll do it at the end, I promise. Write down your question on that sheet of paper that you're ignoring. A count rate is the number of decays that are picked up by a counter every second. There are four types of radiation that we've got to know about intimately. Alpha radiation, where two protons and two neutrons are released from the nucleus. They have a positive charge because they contain two protons. They have the largest mass and the highest um, charge. Beta negative radiation is when an electron is emitted from the nucleus. It results from a neutron splitting, splitting into a proton and an electron. The proton stays in the nucleus and the electron leaves. Beta particles are negatively charged. This is the symbol for a beta particle. Beta positive radiation or positron radiation is when a proton splits into a neutron and a positron. The positron is ejected from the nucleus. The positron has the same mass as an electron, but it has opposite charge. Gamma radiation is an electromagnetic radiation. It has no mass and no charge. It's just a way for my unstable nucleus to release energy into the environment. Gamma rays, because of their makeup, are able to penetrate through almost any material. Uh, but because they have no charge, they're not as dangerous. You recognize, recognize this from nuclear equations, but that is the symbol that we use for alpha radiation because if I have two protons and two neutrons in the nucleus, surrounded by two electrons, that is a helium atom. Now, what's released from the nucleus? Two protons and two neutrons, but no electrons. During alpha radiation, two protons and two neutrons are released, but no electrons. So therefore, this isn't a helium atom, but a helium nucleus. How do we remember this? A student asks the teacher to go to the toilet. Can I go pee pee? Asks the student. No, no, says the teacher. What? No pee? That makes me sad. Fine, says the teacher. Pee now. That made the student happy because he was able to not be in class. Alpha radiation consists of two protons and two neutrons. Being sad is a negative emotion. So beta negative radiation, neutron turns into a proton and a negative electron. Being happy is a positive emotion. So in beta positive radiation, a proton turns into a neutron and a positive electron or a positron. A positron is just a positive electron. Oops. <clears throat> Alpha, beta and gamma radiation can penetrate different materials because of their different nature. If they have got more charge, then they are gonna ionize more. Ionization is the dangerous thing. Ionization is what kills you, is what affects you. Alpha radiation, an alpha source, has got a short range of only about five centimeters in air. Alpha radiation can be stopped by paper. Beta radiation is medium ionizing, so it is dangerous. It can penetrate paper and it is only blocked by an aluminium plate. I'm not playing. If beta radiation interacts with something, it will ionize it. It will, it will irradiate it. If this was hitting living cells and not a lead block, those cells would be being damaged by the beta radiation that's being released. Gamma rays can penetrate paper and aluminium, but they will be stopped by a lead block. They will not ionize the lead block easily. There is some ionizing power in gamma rays, but not a lot. <clears throat> The nuclear model has changed. 
we know that the nucleus is an you know is part of the atom, but our understanding of the nucleus changed over time. Before the discovery of the electron, atoms were thought to be tiny spheres that could not be divided. When we discovered the electron, we realized that actually there are two different parts to my atom. It was decided that we had little negative bits inside a big positive cloud. It was given the term the plum pudding model. A plum pudding is like a chocolate chip cookie or a scone. It was like pastry with little plum bits stuck inside of it. So the plum is the negative stuff. We later on discovered that was wrong when J.J. Rutherford fired alpha particles at a, a gold foil screen. And those alpha particles were either bent around or penetrated or pardon me, bent around or, um, or, 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 or bounced back after hitting the gold foil. We realized that there must be something inside the atom that is really dense with lots of mass and is positively charged. That's how we knew the nucleus existed. Um, chap called Niels Bohr then discovered that electrons orbit nuclei at different um, energy levels and figured out that electrons orbit. There is a video on my YouTube channel that goes through that in great detail, if you'd like to watch it. It's riveting. No P makes you sad. Neutron splits into a proton, uh, proton and electron. Uh, neutron splits into a proton and electron. P now happy a proton splits into a neutron and a positron. <clears throat> you will be asked, guaranteed, 100%, to look at one of these nuclear equations. When a particle undergoes alpha radiation, then there are two protons released from the nucleus. Those two protons that are released from the nucleus will decrease the proton of the parent nucleus. Pardon me, this is my parent nucleus here. Will decrease the, um, the proton number of the parent nucleus by two making the daughter nucleus have two fewer protons. In the nuclear equation, we will then add on to my daughter nucleus the symbol for the type of radiation that occurred. Then we have to look at the numbers and see if they add up. 2 plus 92 equals, ni uh, two plus 90 equals 92. 4 plus 234 equals 238. This atom here in, in this example is undergoing beta negative radiation. So a neutron is turning into a proton and an electron. The neutron stays behind, which means the mass number hasn't changed. However, we have an extra proton. The symbol for beta negative radiation is zero E minus one. Minus one plus seven equals six. Zero plus 14 equals 14. In gamma radiation, there is no change in the proton number or the atomic mass. So there will be no change to the parent nucleus. The same protons, same neutrons, and same electrons. Pause the video and have a go with some of these, if you'd like. Half-life is the amount of time needed to decrease the activity, or the amount of time needed for the activity of a sample to decrease by half. The unit of half-life is time. Seconds, milliseconds, years, millennia. Radio radioactive decay is a random process. It's random, but it's predictable. If I have a large enough sample of nuclei, I can predict the time it will take for half of those nuclei to decay. It's the amount of time it takes for half of the number of nuclei that are there to decay or for the activity to decrease by half. If you know the start and finish count rate, then you can figure out the amount of time that has passed by for the rate or the activity to have decreased by the amount that it has. This is an example of a particular isotope. The count rate of an isotope is 1,008 becquerels. It falls to a count rate of 126 over a period of 21 days. How do I know how many half-lives, how, how do I know the length of that particular half-life? Well, I start off with 1,008 becquerels. It takes one half-life unit of time for that number to decrease by half. 
It'll take another half-life unit of time for that number to decrease by a further half, and another half-life unit of time for that count rate to decrease by a further half. There were three half-lives in those 21 days. If there are three half-lives in those 21 days, then each half-life took seven days. So the half-life of the isotope was seven days. You can also use a graph. If you're given a graph showing the activity rate of a particular sample, you can figure out the half-life from that graph. Look at what the original activity was. Here, my original activity was 200 counts per minute. What is half of that activity? Half of 200 is 100. I will draw a line from 100 until the intercept on my graph. I will then draw a line down to the time to see how many hours, minutes, days, years, millennia it has taken for the count rate to decrease by half. In this case, it is 1.2 hours. Now, if we're right, and if, if this graph is true, if I draw another line at 50, then only 1.2 hours should have passed on this graph. We can see there that it does, because the difference between 1.2 and 2.4 is 1.2 hours. I could do that again if I wanted to. For those of you who don't understand how we can use carbon dating, this is a brief example, just, just a, a quick explanation. Cosmic rays, when they interact with the gases in the air, can sometimes cause atmospheric nitrogen, nitrogen-14, to turn into carbon. Neutrons smash into the nitrogen, protons come out, and now we've got a new radioactive isotope. The carbon-14 is taken in by plants during photosynthesis, and then when the plant dies, or when we eat the plant, or eat the animal that's eaten that plant, we then ingest that radioactive carbon-14. We then have a certain amount of carbon-14 in us. After a certain amount of time, 5,700 years, the total activity, radioactivity of us as living, breathing human beings will decrease by half. We can use the fact that we know that to date certain things, but only if they were alive. We can't use carbon-14 dating for dead things. What is the dangers and the effects of ionizing radiation? Everybody laugh, it's hair loss, go on. <laughs> Radioactive materials are hazardous to life. They can do one of two things. They can either damage DNA and cells. Well, actually, pardon me, they can either damage cells directly by burns or by making um, your cells actually be physically destroyed because of the energy transfers, or they can damage your DNA leading to cancer. What's the effect of ionizing radiation on hair? It causes hair loss because it kills the skin cells in your head. If you have got, if you are um, exposed to ionizing radiation, to high levels of radiation, your skin can physically be burned. It can also lead to skin cancer if the DNA in your skin cells becomes ionized and tumors can form. High doses can cause sterility or mutations in offspring. There's some incredible videos of the types of organisms that have been born in Chernobyl. Um, I mean, dogs with two heads, wolves with no feet, spiders with 14 legs instead of, six, uh, instead of eight. Exposure to radioactive iodine, which is a daughter nucleus of plutonium, I think. Exposure to radioactive iodine can cause your thyroid to be um, affected and can cause thyroid cancers. The bone marrow is responsible for making blood cells. If bone marrow is affected by ionizing radiation, it can lead to leukemia or other blood cancers. Leukemia is um, cancer of white blood cells. What is radiation? Rapidly dividing uncontrollable cells. Cells that are already rapidly dividing, like hair or reproductive organ cells, are the most susceptible to ionizing radiation. Radioactive materials are hazardous, so we have to take precautions against them. The first thing we can do is wear protective clothing. That just has to be thick clothing in the case of alpha radiation. In beta radiation, it would have to be lined with something like lead. We can also limit the dose and our exposure. This is a dosimeter. Dosimeters can show whether or not you have been exposed to a high amount of ionizing radiation. It's just a little badge that goes on your chest. If you see the symbol, you've been exposed to radiation, walk away. Other things that we can do, keep the sample as far away from you as possible. Don't point the sample at yourself. Don't lick it. Literally, don't lick radioactive materials. 
There are two different um, ways that we can be affected by radiation. The first is irradiation. That is where we are exposed to ionizing radiation in our body. It does not mean that our body is radioactive, just that we have been damaged by those nuclear radiations. Protection from irradiation means stopping the radiation from reaching you. That's wearing protective clothing, going behind lead screens, going behind mica screens. Irradiation does not cause radioactive, um, radioactivity to happen. Medical dressings are irradiated to kill any bacteria, microorganisms, viruses, funguses. Just 30 seconds, but literally 30 seconds, sorry. Medical dressings are then not radioactive. They're sterile. They're not going to kill you. They're not going to hurt anybody, but they've got no um, bugs in them. Contamination is when you take in a radioactive source. If there's been a nuclear explosion and there's radioactive dust in the air, you breathe it into your lungs, you are now contaminated. The nuclear source is within you. You can't stop it from hitting you anymore. You are radioactive. The emissions are damaging you and anyone around you. The object remains radioactive until the activity decreases because of half-life or um, the contamination is removed. Here are some questions. Pause the video. I have to wait 10 seconds, otherwise Microsoft Teams doesn't pick it up. I'm sorry, miss. I'm so you'll know why in just one week, Dick. Here are the answers. Mark your work. Done. Okay. So the password for this one to get um, points is turn up purple. <laughs>